Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States of America. I had uh, these terrible headaches, was diagnosed with having a, a uh, anyway, they had to take the top of my head off a couple times, <laughs> see if I had a brain. This has been the President of the United States of America. May God have mercy on our souls. Well, we are on Blaze TV. BlazeTV.com slash Stu. The promo code is Stu. Save 10 bucks off your subscription to Blaze TV. We've got uh, the Tucker Carlson stuff coming up. We've got uh, Bethany Mandel with uh, her new book as well. But we're going to start by doing the AI invasion. Where are we in the AI world? I feel like it ju we just started talking about AI like really recently. And all of a sudden, uh, it's everywhere. Um, and it's hard to understand what part of this arc are we in. Is this some newfangled thing that comes and it goes? Or is this some newfangled thing that we just don't understand at all and it's going to take over all of our lives? I think we've discovered the, the precise moment in this storyline where we are. And I will give it to you right now. It's the moment of Katie Couric. That little mark with the A and then the ring around it. At. See, that's what I said. Mm -hmm. um, Katie said she thought it was about. Yeah. Oh. But I'd never heard it. I'd never heard it said. Back. I'd always seen around. the mark, but never yeah. heard it said. And then yeah. it sounded stupid when I said it. Violence at NBC. <coughs> yeah, I heard around being fired up in the lunchroom the other See? week. <laughs> there it is. Violence at NBC. GE com. I mean, well, what well, Allison should know. What, what do you is say internet about anyway? Internet is uh, that massive computer right. network, mm -hmm. the one that's becoming really big now. What do you mean? That's big. What, how does one? What do you write to it like mail? No, a lot of people use it and communicate. I guess they can communicate with NBC writers and producers. <laughs> That's where we are. What is internet? I don't know. And then later on, we did know, and that's kind of where where we are now. I mean, it's been like what two weeks since we started talking about ChatGPT, and all of a sudden now it's everywhere. It's all over the place. Let me just give you just a general sense as to what's been happening just over the past couple of weeks. Uh, how generative AI is already changing how creatives do their jobs. If you're stuck, for instance, uh, with headline writing, you can prompt it and maybe get out of your writer's block. The exciting new AI transforming search and maybe everything. Explain. Generative e AI is here. Let's hope we're ready. Uh, teachers and students now warming up to chat GPT. Initially, it was like, oh, people are just going to cheat on other homework. Now they're already implementing it into schools. Gut bacteria editing uh, right now. Editing gut bacteria is the next frontier for CRISPR. Yes, that's right. You thought screwing with genes was weird before. Now we're going to throw AI in there. Um, a U.S. Air Force is giving military drones the ability to recognize faces. Yay! 3D printed organs may soon be a reality. Looking ahead, we're not going to need donor hearts. Again, a lot of this stuff seems like it might be good, but it's coming awfully fast, isn't it? Mind-boggling James Webb telescope image shows the same galaxy at three different points in time. Large-scale genome sequencing un a study unrail uh, unravels history, traits, and understudied African populations. AI will become the new normal. How the art world's technological boom is changing the industry. Virtual reality is finally ready to revolutionize education. Using AI to detect breast cancer that doctors miss. Revolutionizing education, the rise of virtual classrooms. Spotify's even got an AI DJ. So in case you wanted someone to talk over your songs that's fake, now you can even have that as well. And it leads you to what the hell are we going to do with all this stuff? Because it's all happening all at once. We're at the precipice of the invasion. We're at that part in Mars Attacks where they're saying, we come in peace. We come in peace. Uh, as AI booms, lawmakers struggle to understand the technology. And if you think, as a lot of people seem to do, that all we got to do is come up with the right laws. We got to come up with the right laws and the right uh, parameters around this and everything will be fine. Will it do you really trust people in our government to understand this at all? They're the people yelling at the TV. What is Internet? 
This is from uh, the New York Times. The problem is that most lawmakers do not even know what AI is, says Representative Jay Olbernolte, a California Republican and the only member of Congress with a master's degree in artificial intelligence. This guy's going to be getting a lot of interviews in the next few years. Before regulation, there needs to be agreement on what the dangers are, and that requires a deep understanding of what AI is. He said, you'd be surprised how much time I spend explaining to my colleagues that the chief dangers of AI will not come from evil robots with red lasers coming out of their eyes. Do we really know that, Jay? Do we? Okay, maybe we do. Look, uh, just like... uh, the people, uh, you know, the aliens attacking in Mars attacks. You know, resistance is really futile. Uh, we can all sit here and say, well, we'll just, let's get control of this before it gets out of control. That's going to be really hard to do. Resisting it completely is basically impossible. And the problem is the good things about capitalism, the good things about markets are going to take over here. And people are just going to really like this stuff. You know, this is kind of what we saw many years ago, and we need to come up with an approach that isn't completely saying we need to go back to the, you know, we we need to be Luddite with this stuff. We need to do, you know, maybe we do the M. Night Shyamalan, the village thing, but that's several years out if things really get out of control. Um, We need to come up with some approach that adopts the good parts of these uh, technologies, but also doesn't let us be overrun by them. And when when I say this, what I'm describing is the opposite of what we do with phones. We're all like, hey, Here's a new, look at this. It's a new phone. It's got a lot of access to data and you can text people and you can get on Facebook and all this stuff. What if we give it one half of our waking hours immediately and see what happens? That's a bad idea. Bad. Maybe we don't jump in all that quickly. That's kind of what we did. And we were acting as if we didn't know what was going to happen. And I will be honest with you. Of course, we didn't know what was going to happen. I think we all could kind of sit back and say, you know, this doesn't seem like a good idea. We sleep for eight hours. We're awake for 16 hours. What if we give half of those hours to our phones? What if we do it with children? Give them uh, 12 year olds. Give them the phone all the time so they can constantly be obsessed of how they appear to not only their friends, which was already screwing them up enough, now to the whole world. What if we put that in their heads every single day and we put them on the phones for eight to 12 hours? Will that turn out well? Sure it will. That's not the way we should approach artificial intelligence. There's a new Substack out. How I changed my mind on social media and teen depression that's making the rounds. Richard Richard Hanania is the author of this. And let me just give you some of this because I think a lot of us might come from the same come to the same perspective as Richard did here. My initial inclination was to treat this story with skepticism, talking about the uh, social media being the cause of all the depression uh, that we're seeing. I tend to dislike moral panics and are used to, and, uh, that are used to justify government intervention in people's personal choices or market forces, particularly of the think-of-the-children variety. Moreover, I think there's a tendency to scapegoat big tech, which I considered an unhealthy impulse that is rooted in both Luddism and anti-market bias, both of which I strongly oppose. And I kind of look at this stuff a lot of times the same way. I I don't want to jump to the freaking out about every little twist and turn when it comes to technology. A lot of times I think back and I think to myself, well, there's been a lot of technological developments and every single time we've wound up figuring it out. It may have brought some negatives, but also a lot of positives. And we wind up figuring it out in the end. That's kind of how this works. I was, uh, I was in, uh, listening to the back and forth that we're hearing now with you know, millennials and Gen Z. And a lot of the complaints you see, these memes that go around, it's like, oh, well, our, by the time uh, they were 30, our parents and grandparents ha- owned their own homes and they had full-time jobs. And look at us. Our life sucks. Look at how bad things are for us. Wah, wah, wah. And I get it, you know, sometimes it feels like maybe you're running behind the pace of your parents or previous generations. And then I got in the car and I listened, I turned on the radio and uh, Allentown from Billy Joel was on. And it's the same story. It's the same bunch of people back in 1978 bitching about how people in the 50s had it so good. Why don't they? Everything's sad. The unions have gone out of town. Wah, wah, wah. It's the same freaking thing. So I tend to go back to that often. I, a lot of the times, these panics are just that, panics. We figure it out, we get through it. The better pr- principles we have, the better we're going to do. And that's why it, these things now seem to be a little different. We no longer have that foundational belief in, in more important things than ourselves. And these, 
these onsets of technology are happening so much faster and happening so quickly and so deeply to our entire society. It's saturated everywhere we go. And we're just at the very beginning of AI. The AI thing is going to hit us just like the phone thing hit us. And that was not necessarily a good thing. More from this uh, substack. A, f a reason I did not want to believe in social media hypothesis, again, for causing teen depression, was that I'd much rather blame wokeness. And the timing of the mental health crisis takeoff roughly matches the beginning of the great awokening. It's annoying to me that intellectuals won't even consider the possibility that radical new ideas about race and sex may be to blame. And the fact that the most liberal demographics, that is women and LGBT adolescents, are having the most mental problems indicates that there is something to the theory that wokeness causes misery. You know, I think there is something to that theory, but the, the onset of social media is maybe a bigger part of it. And it also magnifies all the wokeness makes all this stuff worse. The social media hypothesis is convincing because we have simple, intuitive story backed up by various lines of evidence that all point to the same conclusion. Human beings evolved to gain pleasure from spending time with others. When young people in their developmental years were giving addictive device that stopped them from doing just that, they started getting depressed and anxious. We have a straightforward theory that fits the vast majority of the data. It is supported not only by the cor correlational data linking higher levels of social media use to poor mental outcomes, but also a preponderance of the evidence in randomized controlled trials that ask people to reduce or eliminate social media use. The whole thing's really worth reading because if you look at this, what you're gonna see is study after study after story, study kind of giving that same storyline. If you use more social media, if you're on there that often, you're less happy, you're more depressed, and it goes on and on and on from there. It spirals out of control. But if we all know it's bad, why does everybody keep doing it? And this is the problem here. And this is the thing we all need to internalize when it comes to artificial intelligence because we might be able to convince ourselves it's bad. It may be great in some ways, but it might be bad in some ways, too. And we might be able to isolate in our brains what is bad. The problem is these products are really freaking good at hitting those pleasure centers. They really do give you that hit of dopamine. And we really can't seem to overcome that. Think about, for example, TikTok. Has there ever been an easier example to realize that something is bad for a society than TikTok? Not only do you have all the stuff that's baked into every other piece of social media, the, the, the um, looking at other people and realizing they have a better life than you. Everyone looks so pretty. All the filters are perfect. Everyone has a perfect life. My life sucks. You have all that on there. You have the addictive quality on there. You have the uh, dis destruction of your attention uh, time span all on there. In fact, taken to the extremes. And then you layer on top of that the fact that it is owned by the Chinese Communist Party and has every single intelligence agency all together on the left and the right all saying, holy crap, they're definitely spying on all of us. We better get this off of our devices immediately. And you know what's happened with all that information? It's the most popular app on the entire iPhone system. It's the most popular social ne uh, network out there. Everyone wants to use it more not less. Why? Because it does the really base human things that people seem to want from this crap. So you're not going to be able to just convince people it's bad for you. A couple of years ago on this uh, very program, we talked to the CEO of Impossible Foods, the founder of Impossible Foods. And, you know, whatever you think about him, you know, uh, you know, fake meat, uh, you know, impossible burgers and beyond burgers and all that stuff. Throw it out the window for a second, because his perspective was really interesting on this. He really believes that you, we shouldn't be eating animals and he believes it's good for the climate and all that stuff that you probably don't care about. However, his, he had one really, really interesting observation and we can learn from it right now, which is he said, you know what? What, what, the, what the people who want you to stop eating meat have done for the past 30, 40, 50 years have said, you know what? Eating meat is bad for you. You shouldn't do it because of your health. You shouldn't do it because it's mean to animals. You shouldn't do it because of the climate. You shouldn't do it because of this and this and this and this and this. And whether you believe that stuff or not, his observation, and I think he's right on this, is that it was never, ever going to work. You were going to convince the same three or four percent of the population that they shouldn't eat meat because they think it's bad for one reason or another. What he said was, what we need to do if we really want people to do this 
is come up with a product that they like the same or more. If we can do that, then they'll stop wanting that. And his example was the Chinese Communist Party once again. The Chinese Communist Party has influence over every aspect of their citizens' lives. They have a camera seemingly in every bathroom. They've got uh, surveillance everywhere. They've got the power to do whatever they want. Throw you in a freaking prison camp if you don't listen to them. And a few years ago, they made it come up, came up with this big grand idea, which was to tell all their people it was mandatory for all of them to cut back on their meat consumption by like 30%. So the Chinese Communist Party is going to the Chinese people and saying, all of you need to stop doing this. You know what happened? Their meat intake went up. You know why? They really like meat. The only way you're going to get people to stop eating it is to come up with something they like better. That's it. Just shaming them into this is not going to work. And that's kind of where we are, I think, with these new technologies, including AI. Conservatives need to come up with an alternate v vision from tech-based dystopia that we're kind of looking down the barrel of right now. We have to come up with a differing vision that people want and can actually use the good parts of this technology without it overrunning all of our society. What is the conservative competing vision for technology, in particular, AI. What does that look like? We better get thinking on this. There's a new article in the uh, new column in the, uh, the New Atlantis called Can There Be a Conservative Futurism? Here's an excerpt. Uh, the political right faces a particular challenge and opportunity for thinking constructively about the technological future. The challenge is that too many in the conservative tradition, technological progress is often no progress at all, but merely leaves us more estranged from nature and from one another. Technological progress is, in effect, a move away from a divinely ordered cosmos. The opportunity is that conservatism has deep intellectual resources that can help to overcome this concern while offering a constructive vision that may appeal to those outside the tradi that tradition. And I think that's really, really important thing for us to think about and a really, really important thing for us to come up with an answer to really, really fast. The problem with all these really, reallys is that I don't really freaking know what the answer to that is yet. Do you? Do you know what the right answer to all this stuff is yet? I gotta say, I can see uh, a, um, a pacing idea where we should not run face first into it like we did with iPhones. And I can come up with a lot of criticisms. I can tell you a bunch of stuff that I don't want to do. But what do we want to do? How can we figure this out? How do we, can, how do we decide that we're not overrun by AI in the future. I don't know. So I decided to ask ChatGPT to give me an answer. How, what can society do to not be overrun by AI in the future? This is what ChatGPT thinks we should do. You should totally trust this, by the way. As an AI language model, I believe that AI technology has the potential to bring significant benefits to society. Oh. But it also presents certain risks and challenges. To prevent over, being overrun, overrun by AI in the future, here are some things that society can do. Invest in AI research and development. Wait a minute. You want more? That's going to solve it. We're going to get more AI? Develop AI governance frameworks. Again, this one everyone comes back to. Everyone wants the governance. Everyone wants the barriers set up around AI. The problem is there are going to be bad actors that aren't going to put that governance on and it's going to advance very, very quickly. Encourage collaboration between AI developers and stakeholders. Promote AI education and develop alternate systems. Uh, in summary, society can take a proactive approach to ensure that AI is developed and used in a way that benefits society and reduces the risk of being overrun by the technology. I don't know what we should do exactly, but I can tell you, a, whatever, they're, whatever AI is telling us to do, we should probably do the opposite. Because I have a feeling if we keep listening to AI, we're, we are going to have those robots with the red laser eyes right around the corner. So have you been given bad advice about your retirement savings? Were you told to max out your 401k and maybe that didn't work out well? The Wall Street casino loves to roll the dice with your hard-earned savings. And like a casino, the house 
always wins. They get paid whether you win or whether you lose. There's a better way to grow your nest egg. Bank on Yourself is a guaranteed and predictable retirement plan alternative that gives you 100% control of your money, plus tax-free income in retirement. There's no luck, skill, or guesswork required. Your plan doesn't go backward when the markets tumble either. Both your principal and growth are locked in. Wouldn't it be nice to be protected from a tax tsunami in retirement? Bank on Yourself is the strategy that famous businesses like McDonald's even have used when no banker would lend them a dime, and almost anyone can do it. This is built-in inflation production and the ultimate peace of mind for your retirement. Now get a free report with all the details on how the Bank on Yourself strategy adds guarantees, predictability, tax savings, and control to your financial plan. Go to bankonyourself.com slash stew. Bankonyourself.com slash stew. Check it out now. Understand this because it's really important. Bankonyourself.com slash stew. The kids are not all right. The left is waging an all-out battle for, on the American family, particularly the youngest members. If they can make our children miserable, lead them to question every building block of society, and rebuild their entire concept of reality, then the left and their woke indoctrinators will consider that a victory. But we can't let them win. The book is out now, Stolen Youth, How Radicals Are Erasing Innocence and Indoctrinating a Generation. And one of its co-authors is Bethany Mandel. She is back on the program. Bethany, thanks so much for coming on. Thank you so much for having me, Sue. Congratulations. It's book release day. It's a big day for you. Thank you. Thank you. It's also my birthday. Oh, so this is incredible. Uh, one of the biggest days yeah. of all time. I can't believe you're taking time out on your birthday and book release day to come here. We really do appreciate it. <laughs> of course. Um, I want to, the book is great. I'm about halfway through it so far. You really do a great job uh, kind of laying all this out. I will say you, you have multiple times thrown me into flashbacks uh, from raising my kids and thinking, um, you know, hey, you know, things are crazy right now. Let's plop them down in front of the TV, the Disney Channel or something. That's safe. But let me plop them down. You walk out of the room, you come back in, and you're just horrified. This yeah. is really a, a, somewhat of a new phenomenon, isn't it? Or is it just getting much worse now? No, it, you're right. It is a new phenomenon. And it's funny, Carol and I sort of take different tactics on how we can sort of handle this indoctrination and, and you know, all of these Easter eggs that the left throws into every part of our lives. Um, I'm sort of more of the mind that we should just sort of pull ourselves back and, you know, watch old movies, watch old TV shows, read old books. And so I am, you know, I'm a curator of all things old now in our family. And we watch Richie Rich and the most off color joke in Richie Rich is about how dad's butt is cute. That's as off color as it got in the 90s. And now, you know, my daughter and I tell this story in the book. My, my daughter went to the library and picked out a graphic novel about girl soccer players. And I said, yeah, sure, whatever, I don't care. And threw it, into the, threw it into the library bag. And I, thank God, left the library bag in my trunk for a few days because I was talking to moms doing research for this book, Stolen Youth. And there were two moms in particular who, who said, you know, this book is in our school library and it, it had a, a graphic sort of scene between two girls at a sleepover. And the second mom described the book in more detail and said, it's a graphic novel about girl soccer players. And I said, wait a second. And after we hung up, I went out to my trunk with my flashlight and I looked through the bag and there it was. It was the book that two moms had warned me about. My daughter had picked it up at the library. And after that, I can tell you, we have not just willy-nilly scanned the shelves at the library ever again. Yeah, I mean, it really feels like it's just mines everywhere. And, you know, I, I, I guess like every generation at some level, com, you know, complains about the new thing and how things are changing. And I don't want to be that dad. But on the other hand, I feel like this time is different. Is it just me being paranoid yes. dad or is it actually different this time? No, I mean, if you think about, so today is my 37th birthday. Um, 20 years ago, when I was 17, the manifestation of sort of teenage angst was girls were cutting, there was anorexia, there was drug use. And all of those things are horribly tragic and were not pervasive, but also treated as mental health crises. Now, as 17 year old girls are saying that they are identifying as a different gender, they're binding their breasts, which, you know, carries with it a severe risk of breast cancer. They're taking hormones, which carries a lot of risks in, in itself of uh, 
of, I mean, I mean, we're using them as guinea pigs, so we don't really know, but uh, children who have been on these hormones in the past are uh, at risk for osteoporosis. Um, and, and this isn't just sort of like old man and old woman syndrome. There, there's a, a young woman whose jaw shattered while she was chewing. I mean, the, the osteoporosis at play here is really quite severe. Uh, and then you you run the gamut to top surgery and to really severe surgeries that are mutilating and maiming these young women. And instead of these young women being told, you know, this is a phase and we're going to help you get through it. And becoming a woman is really difficult. We're now telling young girls, there might be something wrong with your body and surgery and drugs can fix it. I mean, that was <laughs> what we were told as teenagers. That that was that was what they were trying to treat was this this idea that our bodies were broken. Yeah, it really is fa fascinating because it's it's you know not only not discouraged, it's encouraged. Like you have to affirm these yeah. these thoughts, and it's of course it's going to screw up kids' heads. And you're also seeing you, you yeah. and you highlight several examples of this. Uh, one of which I I remember just visually coming up with a picture in my mind of I think it was it an owl that had top surgery in a cartoon. Um, and yes. like, this is like, uh, you know, it wasn't the plot of the entire story. So you wouldn't necessarily yeah. notice it looking at it from the surface as a parent. But as you're watching this, these types of things are just slipped in there and it feels like it's intentional. It's not just like, okay, we want to show a little diversity. This is let's slip it by the parents and see if they notice. Yes, absolutely. And this is something that came up time. And again, I spoke to an editor at a top children's uh, publishing company, and she said, all we do now is have meeting after meeting about how we can slip DEI into our content. And, you know, the same we saw with Chris Rufo's explosive videos from Disney. This is by design. And, and a lot of this is really subtle and it's really insidious. And it, it's done in a way to normalize all of this stuff for children. Right when their brains are forming, we're sort of planting these Easter eggs in their brains that, you know, he can be she and she can be they. And none of these things uh, have any basis in, in biology or reality. And, you know, we're treating children as guinea pigs in this way too. It's not just impacting the children who then go on to express a different gender ideology, but we're also telling young children at three years old that, you know, there is no such thing as a boy. There is no such thing as a girl. And when your brain is first developing, you're categorizing everything around you. And I have a three-year-old currently who likes to sit at the dinner table and say, mommy is a girl and daddy is a dad and my sister is a girl and my brothers are boys. And this is how they make sense of the world around them. And we're taking that away from them. And that will not come without cost. Yeah. It, it, and it's just shocking how fast it's gone from, you know, something that like, you know, a few years ago, Saturday Night Live would do jokes about this type of stuff. Yeah. And now, I mean, they wouldn't touch it with a 10 foot pole because you can't have any criticism or any. I mean, it's just now it's like totally in our society and the only way you can look at it. I think it's interesting. Yeah. There's an interesting relationship here, too, between I mean, you talk a lot about, um, you know, schooling and the over sexualization of kids and the transgender issue going on right now. And, you know, it's not disconnected from another focus of the book, which is COVID and the yeah. way the medical um, industry has really gone almost crazy, it seems like, over the past few years, uh, influencing the, the, the bizarre sort of restrictions that we saw from the government, even for little children, things that really, I think, we wound up, uh, we wound up later on looking back at it horror, but these were all pushed by medical authorities once again, who told us this is the only way you're supposed to go. Yeah, and I think that that's one of the unspoken themes of the book, that the experts are not experts and they aren't necessarily out for your children's best interest. Uh, the medical establishment, I, I wrote the chapter about sort of how the woke indoctrination and impact can affect medical care in so many different ways. Um, one of my, my favorite anecdotes from the book was uh, there was a pediatric academic society uh, conference last year in May of 20, I guess it was May of 21. And they, uh, they were buried by an, a Twitter mob of people who said, your conference uh, isn't diverse enough. The, the panelists aren't diverse enough. And so they decided to scrap one of their panels on caring for children who were born severely 
really prematurely. And that science changes on a year to year basis. There's so much new uh, information that needed to be shared at that conference. And it wasn't shared that year because they decided that, that they had to shut that panel down because it wasn't diverse enough. And the impact on sort of research in the future and on continuing education for doctors is that, you know, in future years, they're going to create a panel of experts, not based on expertise, but instead on uh, on their identity and, and their self-identity. Uh, all of these things have an impact on our day-to-day -day care, but also on, you know, medical innovation and research moving forward. All of these things are interconnected, intertwined. And a lot of, uh, a lot of the, the missteps of COVID were because there was a very, very loud minority who were leftist, who decided we had to take an extreme perspective on COVID. And they realized that they could be successful and they're taking those lessons and they're moving them past COVID. And that's what's really terrifying. Yeah, it really is. You go through too, I think, um, the, the political impact of, uh, of a lot of this stuff and how it affects medicine. You know, you, you know, Donald Trump comes out and says he wants to open schools and all of a sudden everyone yeah. has to go the other way. And I remember yeah. at the beginning of this, that, w that wasn't the situation. I remember listening to an interview with, uh, with a doctor, a virologist, I think it was on like Joe Rogan when this was first starting and no one knew yes. anything about this. And in the interview, they talked about how it's not obvious at all that you would close schools. In fact, most of the time, that's a bad answer for this reason and, and, and so many others. And then immediately, as soon as it was like Donald Trump said we should go this way, everyone had to line up the other way. We've turned yeah. into a society where medicine is political, and that seems like a really bad idea. Yeah, I mean, everything is political. Uh, our schools are political. Medicine is political political and they're being captured by this like 7% of people who self-identify as very liberal and we're all sort of along for the ride and this has so many impacts across you know medicine the media um education you name it uh and you know stolen youth was the first first book that sort of chronicled how all of these things are coming at our children and you know what was really frustrating for my co-author carol and i was that we saw all of these COVID restrictions um, sticking around and hitting kids the hardest. Um, and I, I don't think that we have really truly atoned or taken stock of just how harmful all of those all of those restrictions were on children. We still are just barely starting to see the data on, you know, what this did to the speech of children who were who were masked when they were two years old and just starting to learn how to talk. Um, but the emotional impact of, you know, their ability to interface with people emotionally, uh, we don't see any data on that. And there's something that we go into in the book is that we may never see data on any of these things because all of the researchers are of one political persuasion and they're woke. And so we might never see them do the data that uh, that sort of dooms them to mm. have to put their backs against the walls and admit that they made a mistake over COVID. Yeah, it's amazing. And you document in the book how they, you know, the medical establishment was changing rules, for example, on mask usage and how it, it affects speech and, and uh, for young kids. Yeah. And it, it, it was what we all knew. You had to have a lot of face time with yeah. kids and then the masks became fashionable and all of a sudden that was pulled down. You go through all this in the yeah. book. It's great. And at the end, Carol Markowitz, who we had on radio today, who's, who's fantastic as well. You have these yeah. conclusions at the end, how to, pull, uh, how to pull your kids out by you and how to fight from within by Carol. I have to say I'm more on your side right now. I just want to get the heck out of there, but both <laughs> approaches are really necessary. The book is just fantastic. Uh, Stolen Youth, How Radicals Are Erasing Innocence and Indoctrinating a Generation. Carol Markowitz, along with Bethany Mandel, are the authors. Thank you so much for uh, writing this and taking the time to do it and coming on the program as well to explain it. Thank you so much, Sue. So sort of the big political story over the last 24 hours is this video from Tucker Carlson. Now, um, to rewind, basically Kevin McCarthy gave 40 some odd thousand hours of surveillance video of January 6th to Tucker Carlson to kind of sift through and see what maybe the mainstream media and the January 6th committee was not telling us. Um, now, a couple things on that. First of all, I would have liked this to go, I like, you know, Tucker's great, but like I would love it to go to more shows, more um, people so that we can all look through it and and kind of like check this all out ourselves. Who knows, you, you know, one show with 40,000 hours, it's gonna be stuff that you 
probably would miss, I would think. But they did highlight some important parts of the video. And I know we always like to blame the establishment for everything. We should, however, note that Kevin McCarthy was the one who actually gave this up. So uh, a lot of focus on this over the past uh, 24 hours. And a couple of interesting parts of the video. Let me give you one that's kind of surfaced, first of all. This is uh, the Josh Hawley thing. You remember Josh Hawley. He's running away. He's a coward. Everyone was saying he was a coward for running away. Uh, they looked at the video overall. It gives you a totally different picture. Watch. When the committee wasn't accusing Republican office holders of planning riots on January 6th, it was accusing them of running away from those riots like cowards. In the case of Senator Josh Hawley of Missouri, the committee and their allies accused him of both. Josh Hawley is a To prove that Josh Hawley was a coward, the committee released a video of him loping out of the building on the afternoon of January 6th with a police escort. The tape became a staple on social media. Democrats laughed with derision. Later that day, Senator Hawley fled. After those protesters he helped to rile up stormed the Capitol. See for yourself. <laughs> but in fact, the surveillance footage we reviewed shows that famous clip was a sham, edited deceptively by the January 6th committee. The clip was propaganda, not evidence. The actual videotape shows that Hawley was one of many lawmakers being ushered out of the building by Capitol Hill police officers. And in fact, Hawley was at the back of the pack. The coward tape was a lie, one of many from the January 6th committee. I mean, you might not think that that's the most important thing. I'm sure Josh Hawley does. But that is a completely terrible job by the January 6th committee to edit it to look like that when other lawmakers were going out at the same pace right in front of him. He was part of a group and actually at the back of the group. Uh, this is the type of stuff that the January 6th committee does. And you look, you can go too far with this stuff. If you try to make it look like nothing bad happened that day, I'm going to disagree with you. And a lot of Americans are going to disagree with you. There was violence against police officers. There were laws that were broken by some of the protesters. Some of them were in a different position. I mean, there's another video here. This is the QAnon shaman guy and kind of the famous guy with the horns. The fact that this video exists and this guy went to prison is going to prison for four years and did not have this video to exonerate himself or lighten his sentence is pretty fascinating. Watch this dangerous conspiracy theorist dressed in outlandish costume who led the violent insurrection to overthrow American democracy. For these crimes, Chansley was sentenced to nearly four years in prison, far more time than many violent criminals now receive. What did Jacob Chansley do to receive this punishment? To this day, there is dispute over how Chansley got into the Capitol building. But according to our review of the internal surveillance video, it is very clear what happened once he got inside. Virtually every moment of his time inside the Capitol was caught on tape. The tapes show that Capitol Police never stopped Jacob Chansley. They helped him. They acted as his tour guides. Here's video of Chansley in the Senate chamber. Capitol Police officers take him to multiple entrances and even try to open locked doors for him. We counted at least nine officers who were within touching distance of unarmed Jacob Chansley. Not one of them even tried to slow him down. Chansley understood that Capitol Police were his allies. Video shows him giving thanks for them in a prayer on the floor of the Senate. Watch. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for paying the inspiration needed to these police officers to allow us into the building. You gotta say that's freaking weird, right? I mean, that is really, really strange. And, like, look, you, again, can go too far and deny that anything bad happened that day, but, like... That is a very, very strange set of video. And again, like I think you can argue from a police perspective, if you've got 500 people around, you're not going to try to tackle people because it might get worse. Maybe you're going to stand back. But when he's the only one there and there's nine police officers around him, why isn't he just arrested and handcuffed and put on the side of the hallway? I mean, that's very, very strange. And, you know, does point that at the very least, he should have had that video in his possession to be able to defend himself in court. We'll go through more of this as it comes out. Back in a second. Right now, you can buy some gold and get a free safe 
to store it in. That's right. Qualifying purchases from Birch Gold Group now through March 31st. They're going to ship you a free safe directly to your door. Just text my name, Stu, to the number 989898. You'll get a free info kit on gold and claim eligibility for your free safe. Here's the deal. The Fed, you know, keeps raising rates because it's the only tool they have. It's not really working right now. You can't spend your way out of inflation. That's the only thing we seem to know how to do these days. You've seen the impact on the stock market. You've seen the impact on your savings. Uh, you can hedge inflation, though, by owning gold, whether physical gold or in silver in your safe through an IRA or uh, maybe precious, uh, getting precious metals into that IRA, uh, where you can hold real gold and silver in a tax-sheltered retirement account. Whichever way you want to approach it, Birch Gold has an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau and thousands of satisfied customers. Tex text my name, Stu, to the number 989898 for your free info kit on gold and to claim eligibility for your free home safe by March 31st on qualifying purchases. Again, text Stu to the number 989898 for Birch Gold. They will act like somehow this is a perversion of the system to put an idea in front of the legislature, have them act favorably on it, and me sign it into law Correct. and then execute it. That's how constitutional government works. Right. But they say that that's somehow bad. Meanwhile, Obama and Biden, they do executive orders. They don't even go through the legislature, and the media praises that when they're basically changing society and laws through executive fiat. So they just don't like what we're doing. And here's the thing. We're beating them. That is why they're so upset. We are beating the left in Florida. And I don't think we've had an example uh, in my lifetime where you had a government systematically beat the left across a wider range of issues than we've beat them in the state of Florida. We've beat them in a way that has fundamentally realigned the state and I think has put us on a trajectory to be the leading red state in America for the next 10, 20 years. There's Ron DeSantis just uh, actually sitting a few steps in that direction just a few days ago with our own Glenn Beck. Uh, there's a new podcast coming out from Glenn, a more than an hour long conversation with Ron DeSantis. That's going to hit on Thursday for you if you are a Blaze TV subscriber. If you go to blazetv.com slash Stu, use the promo code Stu. You'll save 10 bucks off that subscription and you'll get that podcast from Ron DeSantis. Uh, early, uh, just like every podcast uh, that we uh, do here on the program, uh, on the on the uh, the big podcast set here with Glenn, gets the big guests. You get them a couple days early if you're a Blaze TV subscriber. But if you're not one and you're not you're not ready to pull that uh, trigger yet, that's okay. Uh, you're still going to get the podcast on the Glenn Beck radio feed. That's going to come on Saturday as well. Don't want to miss this conversation with one of the two front runners for the Republican nomination, Ron DeSantis extended interview with Glenn Beck that comes up on Thursday for Blaze TV subscribers and Saturday for everybody. Okay, so here's what happened. The National Park Service wanted to put out a warning to make sure you understand things that are very, very important if you happen to go to a park where wildlife could be present. Don't want to get in any trouble with that wildlife. And so they decided to uh, tweet a warning to everyone, which says this, if you come across a bear, never push a slower friend down, <laughs> even if you feel the friendship has run its course. <laughs> so if the bear attacks out in the wild, don't try to feed your friend to it. That's good advice, I suppose. Well, unless you have a really annoying friend. Like if I was with, running somewhere with Jeffy, you just push him right over. And uh, that, you know, that, that bear is going to feast for weeks at a time. Now, that's kind of a joke, I guess, from the... They're trying to be funny, which is kind of weird. But then they also link to actual bear tips, what to do if you're an attack. And this is one of this is legitimately part of it. They talk about bear attacks, how they're rare. And they say, if you get attacked by a brown grizzly bear, you if you're attacked by a brown or a grizzly bear, leave your pack on and play dead. Lay fat, flat on your stomach with your hands clasped behind your neck. If you're attacked by a black bear, do not play dead. So whatever shade of darkness you see on the fur of the bear, make sure to remember, brown, play dead. Black, do not play dead. Whatever you do, do not play dead or you will be dead.